Welcome to Animal Rights, the Abolitionist Approach Commentary. I'm Gary Francione. This podcast has no bells or whistles. It's not intended to entertain you. It's intended to educate you and to provoke you into thinking critically about important issues of animal ethics, about the abolition of animal exploitation, and about veganism and creative, nonviolent vegan education. This is our second commentary. Before I tell you the topic that I'm going to discuss in this commentary, I'm going to tell you about what was almost discussed in this commentary. I was speaking with Elizabeth Collins, who has the NZ Vegan podcast site out of New Zealand, and I urge you to visit her site. She does fine work. And I was speaking with Elizabeth, and she said, you know, I really think you should have a commentary devoted to pits. And I said, um, well, Elizabeth, you know, I understand that there are people who are interested in, in the whole issue of plants and plant sentience. And, you know, maybe a, in, a, in a future commentary I'll, I'll talk about uh, what does sentience mean and, um, uh, and, and, and how, do we, you know, how do we draw lines and can we draw lines and, and whatnot. And, you know, I, I, I do believe we can draw lines and, uh, and, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in, in, a, in a future commentary. But, Elizabeth, I really don't want to get into a discussion about the moral status of pits and she said no no she said pits and I and I said oh I'm sorry you mean pit bulls and I said yes I said I understand there's a lot of interest in 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 this because of, of efforts um, in various places to have breed specific legislation and and uh, and perceived discrimination against various breeds etc and I said I, I I understand that I said but that's not an issue that really interests me very much because it's 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 more of a of a regulatory issue rather than an issue that addresses the the, the fundamental problem of animals as property etc and she said no 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 I, I don't mean pit bulls I, I mean pits P-E-T-S. And then I realized that we were having a cultural moment. That even though we speak the same language, we weren't understanding each other on a fundamental level. So, um, so I'm dedicating this commentary to you, Elizabeth, for suggesting that I talk about pits. And what I'm going to address in this commentary is um, what normal English speakers, I'm only kidding Elizabeth, what um, what we call pets, the institution of pets. And I always use that with quotes around it because I, I actually can't tell you how much I dislike the word. It implies slavery. And um, it's it's a loaded word. It's a loaded, terribly loaded word. And, uh, and I, I don't like what it means. Um, there are four at least four hot button issues in animal ethics where just raising the issue can get um, animal advocates very excited, animated, and sometimes um, angry. Um, one of the hot button issues is criticisms of animal welfare reform. Uh, as we all know, uh, that is something that gets uh, that can can create a lot of uh, uh, a lot of excitement very very quickly because uh, there are many am animal advocates who believe that uh, animal welfare reform is both morally justifiable and effective. And I disagree on both points. And uh, when I engage them on those issues, uh, they oftentimes get very, very excited. Uh, a second hot button issue I found over the years is sexism, the use of sexism to, or supposedly to promote animal rights. And uh, that's a topic that I'm going to address in a future commentary, probably several future commentaries. I think it's an extremely important issue. And I think uh, that we're making a very serious mistake by uh, promoting sexism uh, in any way uh, to help animals. Uh, the problem is commodification. Uh, and we're not going to stop the commodification of animals by, perpetu by perpetuating the commodification of women. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in, uh, in at least one future commentary, and as I said, probably several. A third hot-button issue is violence. Uh, as you know, 
if you have read or listened to much of my work. Um, I am violently opposed to violence. I think the abolitionist movement should be a movement of peace. The problem is violence. The solution is not violence. And um, that's another issue where uh, whenever I uh, explain why I think that, uh, that, that the use of violence uh, to promote animal rights or supposed, again supposedly to promote animal rights is both morally unjustifiable uh, and and uh, it's incoherent it just makes no sense I mean it's a it, it, it makes no sense whatsoever to me and whenever I explain why I think uh, that uh, that's the case I um, I always get uh, uh, a reaction that is um, oftentimes very very angry and uh, and that's unfortunate that people can't discuss things without getting angry. Uh, that's a problem within the animal movement as a general matter, that there isn't really much discussion. There's just uh, just a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, anger and excitement, but not much calm, rational thinking. And that's unfortunate because a social movement needs calm, rational thinking. But those are the, f the, the and the fourth, the fourth hot button issue is pets. Uh, there are a lot of animal people, a lot of vegans, uh, a lot of abolitionists who who draw the line at pets and say, "Look, you know, I I just think that you know, pets are different. If we treat them well, if we treat them like our children, then what's the problem?" And I don't understand why you criticize the institution of pet ownership. And um, the reason I criticize the institution of pet ownership is because I uh, I'm trying to be consistent. And I think that the institution of pet ownership is morally unjustifiable and that our actual treatment of pets is deplorable. And, uh, you know, again, it's one of these situations where even if it were, even if we treated uh, dogs and cats and other non-humans that we, um, we use as companions, even if we treated them better, it still wouldn't get around the basic issue of the problem of domestication. This is a real hot button issue, and um, you know it's interesting. I uh, several months back, I participated uh, in an online debate on a site called Opposing Views. Opposing Views is a a site that brings people together to debate various topics. Topics. It's an interesting site. You should you should visit it. They they debate a lot of of different topics they have uh, they, they have an animal section in which they they uh, they discuss animal related issues but they discuss all sorts of political and legal and social and cultural issues and they have people uh, generally um, uh, uh, they they uh, they get they get good people on both sides of the issue to discuss uh, and debate issues and I debated the issue of pet ownership and on the other side of, uh, of the debate was the Humane Society of the United States so I was arguing against pet ownership they were arguing for it um, I was recently um, contacted by a reporter who writes for Financial Times magazine in England and um, he contacted me because he was writing a story about pet ownership and he said, you know, we've talked to a lot of different animal advocates, including PETA, and we couldn't get anybody to uh, be critical of pet ownership. And we heard that, uh, you know, you're just about the only person out there who, uh, who will be critical of it. Can, you know, will you talk to us? And I said, sure, I'll be happy to talk to you. And yes, I am critical of it. I think it's deplorable. So it's a hot button issue. It, it, there's a lot of disagreement uh, uh, about it. And I'm sure that some of the things that I'm going to say this evening will upset some of you. That's not my intention. Again, you know, I, I, I want to provoke you into thinking about things. If you, I'm going to make arguments for why I take the position I take. If you think my arguments are wrong, then you think about the reasons about why my arguments are wrong. It's not just a question of, well, you know, you disagree. If you disagree, why do you disagree? What are your reasons for disagreement? And we have all sorts of opportunities on, on, uh, on Facebook uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to debate those things. You can put your comments up uh, to the extent that I think I can say something useful about them. I will if I, uh, if I'm able to. Um, and uh, 
I, I want to tell you all now that that uh, the semester is about to start for me in another 10 days or so. So that's going to take uh, take away some of my time. But there are other people on the Facebook forum who will discuss these issues. And sometimes, uh, oftentimes, there are some. Uh, I haven't been on Facebook very long, but already I have seen some very very interesting, intelligent discussions. Uh, and I'm happy to see that because that's really what we need: our intelligent discussions. Um, so if you disagree with what I say. Think about why you disagree about uh, what I'm saying. All right, I I want to break this down and tell you that that uh, there are I have two reasons why I think that animal uh, uh, the pet ownership is problematic. The first reason, which I regard as really the primary reason, the important reason, one might regard as theoretical. Now, there's a tendency amongst animal people or at least some animal people to say oh theory who cares about theory you know we want to we're, we're into action we want to you know, we're, we're concerned about action what's he wasting time talking about theory why is he wasting time talking about theory and the answer is my friends theory is essential if you don't have a theory you don't know what actions you're going to undertake your actions your choice of actions we all have lots of choices about what we're doing about what we're going to do when we're going to engage in animal advocacy we have we have many choices about what it is we're going to promote or not promote and what we choose to do will be guided by what theory we think is 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 a good one is the better one so if i have an hour of time today and i'm going to uh, go and you know go down to a, a, you know a, 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 some public space and table about animal rights um, or animal issues. I have the choice of whether I'm going to promote cage-free eggs or whether I'm going to spend that hour trying to explain to people why they shouldn't be eating eggs at all. That choice, the choice that I make, is going to be guided by what theory I have about whether or not I think it is a good thing to promote happy animal products or whether I think that that uh, you know it's morally justifiable to consume cage-free eggs or whether I think that any sort of welfare reform is morally meaningful or thing I mean these are the sorts of issues these are theoretical issues I have to have worked out in my head before I decide what it is I'm going to do and so do you so um, there's this tendency to say well you know theory who cares about theory the answer is I care about it and you should care about it because it determines what actions you are going to undertake. So the first reason that I object to pet ownership might be called the theoretical reason, but that doesn't mean it's not important. It's extremely important. I think domestication is slavery, pure and simple. Now let me say this. Anna and I live with four rescued dogs. We've had up to seven at one time. We regard them as refugees. They would be dead if they weren't living with us. We regard them as members of our family, and you know what? You will not find two people in the world who enjoy interacting with dogs more than we do. But if there were two dogs left on the planet, and it were up to us as to whether or not they were going to continue to breed so that people could have pets, the answer would be a very clear, a very unequivocal no. Absolutely not. Domestication is slavery. We take animals, I mean, th think about it. Just think about it for a second. This is really not a, a difficult conceptual problem. Think about a, how unnatural the life of a dog or a cat is. These are non-human animals that are not part of the animal world, and they're not part of the human world. They exist in this, this nether world of vulnerability. They are completely dependent on us. We control every single aspect of their lives. They're dependent on us for when they eat, to make sure that we fill their, their water bowls, to make sure that they get veterinary care, to make sure that you know we, we let them out at, at appropriate times, that we take them for walks, that we exercise them. That we, I mean, they are dependent on us for everything. And they are perpetually dependent on us. It's, they're not like children, where you know you have if you have children, uh, at some point they become autonomous. Some, 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 some tend to uh, 
uh, not, but um, but but most of them, most uh, children become uh, uh, autonomous, and uh, you know, it's called growing up, and um, and go off on their own and 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 whatnot. Animals can never do that. They're always going to be. They're going. They're they're in a state of perpetual dependence on us for everything about their lives, and that I suggest is inherently problematic. That's not that. That is not in any way uh, a natural state of affairs, and indeed, it's an unnatural state of affairs, and it involves us in a position of con- uh, necessarily in a position of control and in a position of hierarchy. I suggest that, however well we treat our dogs and our cats, they are still ultimately slaves that we control and who really don't fit anywhere. They don't fit in the animal world and they don't fit in the human world. They just exist in this sort of in-between. And they have to hope that we have their interests in mind and in our hearts and that we take care of them because they don't have a whole lot of say if we don't. So, the first problem with pet ownership is domestication. Domestication, I believe, is morally unjustifiable and morally objectionable. Now, one can say, but wait a minute, you know, a long time ago, wolves walked into to caves or they got close to humans because humans had uh, food that they that they uh, discarded, or because uh, they wanted to be warm and and, and uh, be close to humans, so there was a sort of a mutual uh, a relationship, and and the, you know the humans derive something from it, the wolves derive something from it. Well, you know that's really interesting, and and I you know I like I like uh, uh, anthropology as much as the next person does, but the bottom line is, who cares that you know I mean I, I don't really care how it developed. Um, the bottom line is it can't be justified anymore. We shouldn't be doing it, okay? Um, and whether or not there was some benefit uh, that animals derived uh, is an interesting question. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. I don't really care. It's irrelevant now. I mean, what happened back then is irrelevant to what our moral obligations are now. And so I would suggest that the first and the primary problem with pet ownership is that domestication is wrong. It is a form of slavery. It involves us necessarily in controlling every aspect of an animal's life. The next problem, which is a, also a theoretical problem, although it bleeds into the, 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 the practical issues, and that is the property status of animals. Animals, uh, our pets, are chattel property. Now. Everybody who's listening to this, who has a dog or a cat or some other non-human companion, is saying, well, wait a minute now. I don't regard my dogs or my cats as property. I, certainly not. I regard them as members of my family. Well, good for you. But the law regards them as property. And what that means is really quite simple. They belong to you. They're your property. If you wish to value them, if you wish to accord them a higher value than their market value, you can do that. Okay? Our dogs are all, you know, basically, we have uh, one, uh, one was a uh, uh, rescue from the street, one was a rescue from, two were rescues from a kill shelter, and one came from a rescue, uh, from a rescue group. We certainly regard our four canines as members of our family, certainly. But, and we choose to, and we give them very, very good care. They have high quality vegan, by the way, vegan, high quality vegan food. Um, and we take a, a, what I think is excellent care of them, and we spend a great deal of, uh, of, of money on them. Um, but that's our choice. They're our property. 
if we wish to value them above their market value, we can do that. That's our that's our choice as property owners. Just as if you, if you have a car and the car is not really worth very much, but you like it, it has sentimental value to you, you can spend a lot of money on it. You can spend more money than the market value of the car, keeping the car maintained in a particular way. This is what it means to be a property owner. You get to value. There's a market value for your property, but you, the property owner, get to value, ultimately, what the the... You, you get to determine what the value of the property is. So even though we value our dogs as members of our family, and we don't, we don't even think about them as our property, if we wanted to, we could keep them outside as long as they had enough food, water, and sufficient shelter. We could keep them outside, never let them in the house, never show them any affection. We could keep them on chains, we could we could uh, use them as guard dogs uh, and uh, and discipline them, i.e., beat them um, if they didn't perform uh, the way we wanted them to. Uh, there's an enormous, uh, I mean, w w there's an enormous range of abusive behavior that we could inflict on them if we decided to value them at a lower in a lower way. Okay, so so they're our property, and because they're our property. We have the, it's, again, it's part of our control. We get to control what their value is to us. Okay, we determine what their value is to us. We can value them high, we can value them low. Now this goes into the second point, which is the way animals are treated. Because, you know, they're, again, as in most, most, of the, most of the time, when I'm talking about uh, abolitionist theory, I'm just drawing a distinction between use and treatment. And it's my view that however humane the treatment is, and I don't think treatment is ever humane, it can't be for a variety of reasons, and I'm not even sure what that means. But to me, animal use can't be justified irrespective of how humane the treatment is. But I'm always drawing a line between use and treatment. Now, what I've just argued in terms of, of, of domestication and the property status of animals is I'm saying, in, in a sense, we can't justify using animals as pets, however humanely we treat them. That's really not the point. The point is they are property. They are chattel property. They're economic entities. And because domestication is not morally justifiable, we really shouldn't have the institution of pet ownership. But then there's a the separate problem of treatment. Because they are property and because people can value them at a low level, many people choose to do so. And although we have this fantasy that people treat their dogs and cats well, but you know they don't treat other animals well, that's a fantasy. That's a complete fantasy. Some of us treat our dogs and our cats and our other non-human companions very, very well. Many, many of us don't. In the United States, a, a dog has a home for a relatively short period of time before the dog is either taken to a shelter, transferred to someone else's ownership, or taken to a veterinarian to be killed. And, and by the way, because they're our property, we, we can do that. You, any, any of us today don't want to take care of our dogs or cats anymore can take them to a shelter or can take them to a veterinarian and have them killed and in some places can kill them ourselves okay and as long as we comply with certain regulations that we don't discharge firearms in places where we're not supposed to discharge firearms etc but but we can kill our animals we can dump them in shelters it's generally illegal to dump them on the highways but people do it all the time okay uh, so so it's generally illegal to abandon your animal but it's done all the time and The bottom line is, although some of us take very, very good care of our animals, most of us don't. Some of us regard our dogs and cats as members of our family. But think about all of the places you've been where you've seen animals being used as guard dogs or where stores use cats as basically living mouse catchers, where they don't feed them at all, they just, you know, they just have them in the store to catch mice and if uh, so the cat has a great incentive to find mice or else the cat starves so it, dogs are used for all sorts of purposes that are really terrible cats are used for all sorts of purposes that are really terrible and and dogs and cats are treated 
very, very badly as a general matter. Very badly. Uh, again, it really wouldn't matter to me whether we treated them better. It's still There would still be the moral problem of domestication and the property status, the fact that they would still exist as chattel property. And there's really no other way we can have a... You, know, the, you, you can't really change the status. Uh, I have heard people say, well, why don't we give them the status of children? Well, yes, um, that, that makes absolutely no sense. You could never... You could never implement that in any sort of meaningful way in terms of the only way we're ever going to relate to them is as our property. That's the only, that's the only uh, 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 sort of relationship uh, that is practical and that could be worked out. Okay, I mean, think about all the trouble they're having working out health care right now in the United States, which in many ways is, is, a, is a much simpler problem. Uh, can you imagine if somebody said, oh, well, we're, gonna, we're going to have, uh, have, we're gonna give uh, non-human animals the status of children, please. I mean, that, uh, that is completely crazy. Um, so we've got the problem of domestication. We've got the problem of property status as a sort of the theoretical issues. Then we've got the problems of treatment. A lot of people just treat animals terribly. I mean, they're treated absolutely terribly. Dogs and cats and other animals used as non-human companions are treated absolutely terribly. Okay, even if they weren't, it wouldn't make a difference. But they are. So. I think the institution of pet ownership is problematic for theoretical reasons and for practical reasons. And you know, it's a sad comment when you go to Pet Finders. That's just one site. There's a zillion sites out there. You go to Pet Finders and there's like 300,000 animals right now looking for homes. That's crazy. That's wrong. I mean, you know, when you have an institution that has results like that, you know, we have this, this institution of pet ownership where at this very moment, on one site, there are 300,000 animals looking for a home. I suggest that that means that there's a serious problem with the institution. Again, even if there weren't 300,000 animals looking for homes, even if there weren't people abusing their animals, we would still have the problem of domestication and the problem that what that means is we control these creatures completely. We make them live a completely unnatural life. We wonder why our dogs and our cats behave in neurotic ways, as most dogs and cats do behave. And the answer is simple, because they don't belong in our world. They have no world of their own. They live in a situation in which we control every single aspect of their behavior. It's simply not right. And on top of that, many people treat their dogs and their cats and their other non-human companions horribly. But again, even if they didn't, even if there weren't 300,000 animals on Pet Finder, even if there weren't animals being beaten, abused, and tortured in all sorts of ways right now at this very second, the institution would itself be wrong. The final point I want to address is the issue of spaying and neutering and whether animals have a right to sexual behavior. I frequently hear animal advocates say, well, wait a minute. It's wrong. It violates animal rights because animals have an interest in having sex and we ought to let them have sex. Well, I have no doubt that animals have an interest in sexual behavior. I also have no doubt that children have interests in sexual behavior, but none of us, at least I hope none of us, believes that it's a good idea to allow children to engage in sexual behavior. Uh, I think that uh, there is nothing wrong with saying that uh, we ought not to be uh, allowing animals to engage in sexual behavior. The notion that it is somehow unnatural to not allow animals to engage in sexual behavior is bizarre to me. What, I what about an, a, a, a pet's life? What about a pet's life is natural? And the answer is nothing. There is nothing natural about a pet's life. So when we get to sex and someone says, well, that's not natural. Well, <laughs> welcome to pet ownership. Nothing about pet ownership is natural. Now, having said that, I am all in favor of of uh, uh, alternatives. Uh, there are currently discussions going on uh, that I have been reading about uh, in terms of people arguing that in certain situations tubal ligations and vasectomies are, are uh, better alternatives. Not necessarily in all cases, but in some cases. If, if that is true, then obviously less surgical inter intervention is better than more surgical intervention. But the bottom line is we should stop the breeding of animals. And, you know, is there a difference between a puppy mill and a small breeder? The answer is, of course there is a difference. Uh, puppy mills are horrible places where animals are tortured. But there is no such thing as a responsible breeder because there's no such thing as responsible breeding. We shouldn't be breeding animals at all.
And so, you know, it's that the problem is the institution. So when people say, well, you know, puppy mills are horrible, we ought to get rid of them. Yes, we ought to get rid of them, but animal advocates also, animal advocates also, in their efforts to, to stop puppy mills, also ought to be advocating that there should be no breeding of animals. And that's really the problem. None of the animal organizations want to do that. They're happy to take on the puppy mills, but they don't want to take on the, quote, responsible breeders. I think that is irresponsible. And I also want to say that um, there are a lot of uh, animal advocates who really care about their animals, but nevertheless who seem to not have a serious problem with things like declawing or ear cropping or tail docking and things like that. Uh, it's bizarre that people who really do care about animals or claim to care about animals mutilate their animals in this way. I mean, again, I, I think that that shows how deeply problematic the institution of pet ownership is. Well, that's all I have to say about this issue, at least for the time being. I'm sure I'll get comments and perhaps I will respond to them uh, in a future commentary. And uh, visit our website, www.abolitionistapproach.com. And uh, final thought, go vegan. It's easy, it's good for you, it's good for the planet, and most importantly, it's the morally right thing to do. Thank you. Goodbye.